Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world, have a good day. And I hope you are having one because we are here again talking about family history, which is something that makes every day a good day. We are going to be having our monthly Q&A session now every second Wednesday of the month. It's that time again already. So I've seen some questions come in, but don't be afraid if you've got any questions or thoughts or queries, bring them into the conversation, say hello, and then we'll see what we can get through as well. We've got the whole hour to go through as many as we can. And so let's see what we can talk about, and what we can do, see if we can share some knowledge and some tips. Uh, this is an exciting week uh, because you'll also have a great Farmer Pass Friday uh, with uh, me again. So we might follow up on some of those things that we talk about today. So again, it gives you a bit of a chance to uh, maybe have a bit of a research session, then come back with your answers. So that makes things even more exciting. So I see people saying hello. I see Beth, I see William, I see Alan, I see Andrew, I see Hilary, uh, Marge, and some more, Pat, Rosie, lots and lots of people saying hello. Uh, the uh, customary Find My Path weather report I can see as well. We've seen it's, it's dry in Cumbria, but they've had rain on and off. Uh, I see other people saying about different uh, weather. It's, it's sunny in Northampton. I see Rita from New Jersey. Uh, I see Anya as well. Um, and I see Linda Ellie is in the comments. Uh, so she'll be shepherding things along and she'll be providing links to any of the great record sets we talk about, hopefully, that are on Find My Past. And then, of course, um, we've got uh, some lovely things that our community will talk about and they'll all be in there and i'm sure you know many of each other already hi tess from rotterdam uh, i see a oh, happy nurses day alison well, i didn't know it was that and uh, that's something to celebrate we've got some good nurses collections and farmer past as well there are some good records you can find when you look for uh, those people who are uh, in the nursing profession so that's an interesting one as well and uh, i see uh, um <laughs> Ellie is saying she wouldn't mind if the weather would perk up a bit here in Edinburgh. And uh, yeah, I, I would say it's been quite grey, but uh, it's it's Edinburgh. So if it wasn't grey, it wouldn't be Edinburgh. So um, I'm quite happy with that. Sean is uh, in New Zealand. It's getting cold in New Zealand. And uh, uh, I see everyone from all over the world. It's fantastic. We've got Australia. We've got America. We've got the, the Netherlands. We have New Zealand. Uh, how exciting is that? Lots and lots of things to talk about and lots of people from everywhere and uh, that's the way we like it so we've had some questions in advance uh, when there's a post put up earlier in the week people can ask their questions and they're ready to go already and then if you have any more questions then of course you can throw them into the chat so we're going to take a quick look at some of those early questions and see what we can go through so let's take a look um, let's start with Angeal because I saw you in the, the chat, so I know you're here, so you can get your answer. So I'm going to read aloud her question and let's have a go. So her two times great grandfather, Charles Cashmore, was born in West Bromwich in 1833. They're on the 1841 census with their father, John, a pistol maker, and his siblings, Emma and David. Sibling Joel and mother are missing, assumed dead. By 1851, and a search reveals Father John is living with daughter Emma and her husband Joseph Davis and children, and a huge search reveals charges Charles is living as a lodger and apprentice to John Hodnell, an engineer, which is great because now I know why Charles is first in a line of engineers. However, Charles married in 1856 a Mary Ann Smith. They have at least one child, Sarah Maria, 1859, but I can't find them anywhere in the 1861 census. I do know that by 1882, they go to Utah and the USA. 1861 is my block. So we might need a little bit more information to get this completely right. But from what I'm gathering here, you have a record in Utah in 1882, and you have this gap. Uh, I would say I mean, Utah at this kind of point is a time for uh, missionaries and, and people going to Utah as part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, they have a lot of records of those people that did make the journey and were church members. That's one thing to run through and see what, what comes back. Um, it possibly they aren't members and they came to support the growth of that area. That's also possible. Um, there are passenger lists from this kind of point to the United States. And arriving passenger lists give you lots more information than one's leaving and especially in the uk uh, 1890 is the time that you'll get most of your passengers starting that's when a second copy 
of all of these passenger records was asked to be given to the Board of Trade. And that's the records that you'll find on Farmer Pass for passengers leaving the UK, 1890 to 1960. Before then, there was no real requirement to keep these records. So lots of them have just been destroyed. There's only a handful that survive, very small percentage of which some are on Find My Past, very early ones. It's a separate collection, and that's worth looking at, but it's I would say maybe 2% of the total. So um, it's always worth a look because, you know, every time something happens, it's always our ancestor, and maybe this time our ancestor is a lucky one. So we've got that to, to hope for. But uh, I would say you sh you've got a few censuses that we can look at. So although we can't find 1861, there's the 1871 British census, and then you've also got 1881, and then you've got 1860, 1870, and 1880 in the US, because their censuses are with a zero rather than a one. So all of these are going to be really hopefully useful to try and narrow down the window, because that's the sort of thing we're trying to do. Whenever you've got a big family history problem and you have a broad span of, let's say, here, I think it's about 30 years, and we don't know what's going on, if we can narrow that down to five years or 10 years, then that's going to make things much easier. 30 years or 20 years or however long is, is a generation, and that's that's quite hard to narrow down, especially when you could be looking anywhere in the world. So try and get other records. I'm guessing that if they're engineers, they're probably not going to be on electoral registers, but they may be in trade directories. And that might be good. Trade and postal directories might be helpful just to see who's living at different houses. I'd also use our fantastic census address search, which we released just recently. And I would look at the addresses that you have, these places that you can see and see who's in these houses in the next censuses. If it's a member of the same family, then maybe, you know, we know those people might be elsewhere, somewhere nearby or something like that. If the whole house looks like it's been, you know, gotten rid of, everyone's left, then you might have more of an idea uh, that they may have gone abroad. But also you may find them there, perhaps mistranscribed or perhaps something like that. And it's always worth looking. So always do that and see what you can find. Uh, that's a really big point when you're a bit stuck when it comes to censuses. Um, and uh, so those passenger lists as well will help you. And as well as that, so we've got the, the Church History Library and some records uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So there's three, four, if we count both sides of the census, different avenues that you could take to try and narrow it down. So I would start with those and work your way through, and hopefully that will help. And do let us know uh, what you've got back from that uh, when we meet again, perhaps on Friday or again, and on your uh, posted uh, an interesting link that helps with LDS migration, Saints by Sea. And there are lots of uh, websites and collections that are uh, around that can help with that because it's a very noted uh, passage. And so uh, there are lots of documents that might be of interest. I see Karen is uh, waiting in the doctor's room for their second jab. Oh, they've just had it. Oh, well, that's uh, well done and uh, welcome to uh, you know the, the the right place to be where we're online and don't have to be uh, any social distance because we're all safe behind a computer screen so it's a good place to go i uh, see so uh angel said that they, they were, didn't go to the usa until 1882 so that's that's the moving date several children born in west bromwich but missing in 1851 if you've got the years of the children's birth as well uh in, in that space then you've got to really start, I said, use that address search to see who's in these properties and start using the names. If your name is more common, you can use, if you go to the individual search from our all record sets, someone else in the household. So you can find not just John Smith, but you can find John Smith living with a Mary and that will narrow things down. Start really broad and then just add in a little bits of extra detail. Use uh, the wild cards and variants that we've talked about and we should always talk about again, really important. An asterisk if you don't know what letters might be there and you don't know if there are any letters at all and a question mark if you don't know what the letter might be so for cashmore perhaps c question mark sh which might give it for koshmore or something like that which something might be misread at and that kind of thing that will help you too so a few other things and take a look as well and you look at baptisms of these children sometimes they give you the residence the address of the parents and that will hopefully lead you to a census again census address search in that point and see who's living at that house as well and see if that residence changes and that should hopefully be a good start 
So, and uh, William has mentioned a good point. The newspapers are great for passenger lists as well. A lot of articles often mention passengers arriving in places and when traveling for key events, put a family name in a newspaper and you might get lucky. Newspapers are great for things like that. I know the New Zealand and Australian newspapers often have lists of people who've arrived and that's quite useful, particularly if you can't get access to passenger lists in these places. So take a look at those as well. I know that there's a, a large collection of uh, newspapers digitized for those parts of the world in Trove and Papers Past. And then, of course, we've got some good newspapers from around there as well, that are, and the British Newspaper Archive and the Find My Past newspapers. The newspapers from around the world that are from the British Library are in the British Newspapers collection. So don't let that put you off. But there are a few. I think it's is Hamilton. I'm just not sure um, that we have Canada. I think we have somewhere else from um, New Zealand that is a, quite a large newspaper as well. So there are a few others uh, that are really worth looking at that are in that collection. So it's worth taking a look. Um, and uh, so Angel said um, she has all the censuses except 1861. So that's the, if that's the only one you're looking for and you've looked before and after uh, and You've got these births that will give you the addresses to kind of narrow things down and just keep pushing closer and closer. And if they're definitely around, I would say it's probably a mistranscription or perhaps uh, they've not been caught on census night. Uh, but uh, that's a very small chance, I would say. I think it's more likely they're there and they're just below the surface somewhere. So take a look at those other tips and see what we can do. And keep your search really broad to start off with, as always. I see um, George have said, only official bankruptcy records for 1861 in London. I found a mention of my ancestor going bankrupt at this time in the London Gazette. Doesn't give any reason or further details in newspaper, only his address. If you've got the London Gazette, that's a really good start. That's uh, the best place to look for people who've gone bankrupt. Then it would become a legal matter and um, the person's estate would have to be dealt with and things. You might find papers of that kind of thing that survive. Um, you might even find people at places like Chancery Court who have gone through the process of trying to get inheritance and getting things from this kind of thing. I think that's less likely in this case because uh, I think if someone's just gone bankrupt, you're probably looking at someone who's just been appointed to deal with it. And those records may exist in a local archive. But I think when you've got the Gazette, you're kind of close to having it all. Um, I'd also look at local newspapers because they might tell you a little bit more information and you'll often find people's property being sold off in newspapers. And so you'll find a bit more detail. You might even get a list of the property that that person owned. So I would start with that. And if you've got the date of bankruptcy, look around that point, look just afterwards and see what comes out of that. And you might, if you look a little bit before, possibly find out why they went bankrupt but that's not a guarantee but afterwards you've got more chance of finding something interesting so definitely try that as well and uh here we go so sam has said they had their dna done it matched their first cousin one times removed but it didn't match his son so that's an interesting question and that's one that's exciting to talk about so think of dna like a cake and um, let's say we're at a wonderful family wedding because that's the best way that family history uh, is spread around and there are 100 slices because that's the easiest way. I'm not very good with sums. Let's start with simple numbers. 100 slices of cake and when you're born, you take roughly half from each father and mother. So 48 slices, 452, 50, 50, something along those lines. And then um, you'll do the same thing again with your children. So they'll take half and half, but they don't just split it down the middle. They might take slice number three, slice number nine, slices number 20 to 30. And so it's a chance what you get. So by chance, and this is why you'll get people who might look a lot more like one grandparent, for example, they might inherit by chance of this slicing, because it's there's infinite possibilities of how things can be arranged, they might have inherited a lot from one grandparent and almost nothing from another. By pure chance, they might inherit actually nothing from one grandparent. And then all of those ancestors are gone when we're trying to do DNA testing. So that's why it's important to test siblings, test parents, test uncles, aunts, because they're all going to have different combinations of this DNA. So if you have your match with your um, first cousin, you've got a piece of DNA that you share, but his son may well not have inherited that piece. So that's why there's no match, and that's what it is. And that's one of the things about chance that means that you might have some pretty close relatives that you share no DNA with. 
And you might also have some really distant relatives that you share a lot of DNA with, more DNA than you should because it's much further away. And that's why when people look at estimating relationships, when they look at DNA, they give a bit of a range. And they're not perfect, but it's a kind of an average range of the sort of amounts of DNA that you'd expect. And that's how they can guess at how close a relationship is. So it, that makes sense. So I wouldn't worry too much, I think. And uh, everything is as normal, Sam. And um, yeah, don't worry um, that it's not showing you anything untoward, but it is a really big marker and a big thing to make sure that you test as many people as possible if they'll let you because you will get different results. And those different results could be the answer between uh, finding uh, a relative and not. And it's uh, one of those big things if you can get as many people to uh, add to your tests and you can start to work things in. I'm trying to get my uh, great aunt to do the same as well so I can uh, add that to my grandfather's and get some more um, DNA from my uh, Cleland family going further back and things. And it's uh, a big thing because then at the end you can match with more people and match closer. So it's really, really important to see where things come from. Um, let's see. So Christine has a question about war graves in France. Um, are there maps of the cemeteries? I know it's a North Australian grave reference E1. Thinking of going to this one and the other one. Uh, and one other was a friend relative, as a relative. My relative would have been great uncle. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission have maps and they have information about all of these places. A uh, really good website, really good place to look. And they take care. They're the custodians of all of these places. So um, take a look on their website. It will depend on which cemetery it is, but they should hopefully be listed and marked. And I remember going to, I think it was Tyne Cot, which is one of the larger cemeteries. And um, that had a reference. You could find a name, you could look at the reference, and you could then work out where to go to pay your respects. Because otherwise, with the, the thousands of people buried there, it's really difficult to get to. So once you've got that reference, they will be able to help you get there and take a look. And there is a website, I can't remember the name of it, that um, has photographs as well of these places. Um, and um, I think for a pound or something like that, you can get a copy of that photograph if you can't go there yourself. But I know how important it is to go and pay your own respects. So I recommend that as well. When we can travel again, uh, it's definitely worth going and taking a look. And it's a very somber, very emotive thing to do. There's a few places, well, I can't, can't remember the name. I think it's called Polygon Wood, I think is nearby. And um, that's a, a preserved set of trenches. And it's worth walking through those and taking a look because it's very um, different. And it's it brings it really home, the First World War, and, and what these people must have gone through. It's a really... Um, um, really moving thing to do, as well as see the grave. You can see moments of their their life as well. So I recommend that too. Let's see what else we have. And um, so uh, Josephine, when we're talking about DNA. Uh, on the DNA, it says they're sixty one point five percent European, and uh, they didn't know they had that. Well, Josephine, this is another. Uh, we've gone in a DNA way today, but those percentages are um, used because people will compare to a population and they'll see what you've got in common. And so let's say we take three of us from this chat and we find out we've all got brown eyes. And so you look at the DNA that we have and say, okay, well, they've all got this piece of DNA, so that must be the DNA for brown eyes or something like that. So it might be, but also it might be because we've all got right-handed you, know, um, you know, writing or anything like that. So it might be something completely different. It might be down to the way that our hair curls or something instead. So it's not a guarantee, but the bigger you make these comparisons, the more people that you compare against, the easier it is to spot the thing that everyone has in common. So when you take a large amount of population, you compare and you say, ah, well, these 500 people are all from Sweden. What have they got in common? Or these 10,000 people are from Belgium. What makes them Belgian sort of thing? What have they got in common in their DNA? And that's how you end up with a more and more accurate picture. And that's why those percentages that you'll see online will change over time because things will get more accurate as more people are put into this pool and people can be more confident of what they see in the percentages. So when you see a percentage, yes, they might be exactly right, but they also might not quite be there because of the fact that to, to know for sure, you'd have to test everyone in the country. And also, you're testing the modern population, not the old population where your ancestor might have been. So that also makes a little change too. 
And no one has tested everyone, and we can never test um, the old population because, of course, um, they're long, no longer with us. So we have to use approximations, and that's what it is. It's an approximation. It's interesting and it's fascinating, but don't base your all research on the fact that you are 5% Swedish now and you have to go and then find some Swedish records or anything like that. It could be something else. It could be, as we said, with these pies and the cakes and the slices, you might be pulling a tiny bit of DNA from a thousand years ago that everyone from a region has Viking heritage and then maybe that little bit of Viking heritage has come through and because everyone's got that bit and it's echoing through or something like that. So there are lots of explanations, but it doesn't mean that then you have to think you've got a Swedish great-great-grandfather great and you have to find the record and all your records are wrong. Use DNA to triangulate and match with cousins and things. And if you can match a cousin, then you can guarantee, especially if you can find the paper that matches people together, you know that your research is correct. And that's a great feeling. That's something that's really important because then you can confirm that all your lines and the people you found and the names you've attached are right. And that is what I use DNA for. I use it to make sure that I've got an accurate tree. And I know back to certain years that my tree, because I've got three or four cousins all connecting through different lines back to a certain person, that that person is definitely our ancestor and everything is right to them. So that's what it's really useful for. It's only really useful when you have paper as well. People who use just DNA, they're missing out. People who use just records, they're missing out on that chance to prove things. So there's a bit where both can come together. And that's what's so exciting about doing family history in this modern time, because we've got access to all this kind of thing. Um, so let's see what we've got here. Um, I'm seeing some more um, comments as well as questions. Um, Anya said her uh, estimates have certainly changed over the years. Yeah, mine too. I've been uh, all kinds of different nationalities for a little while. Um, I remember I was Albanian for a little, uh, I think it was for a couple of months. That was fun. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of things. So yeah, take it with a pinch of salt. Don't change all your research. It's interesting. It's a bit of fun. But don't take it as the law. Use other things. And remember, prove your research and use it to find cousins. Use it to reach out to cousins. That kind of thing is what's really important. I see uh, Sylvia is uh, very excited to be offered an appointment to go to National Records of Scotland to continue her PhD research. Well, that's exciting. I see things are opening up again. That's great. Um, Gillian has did, done her DNA. Someone from the US got in touch with her. He's looking into a family line on her Nana's half-brother's side of the family. Managed to give him some info he didn't have. I think that's one of the big things, isn't it? Sharing the information, seeing the bits that you don't have, particularly the branch that, say, moved away. You know, they know everything about that branch, and you know nothing. And you might know lots about the branch that stayed. And so there's plenty to share. And I think if you give a little, you usually get a little as well. It takes a bit of um, kindness, I think. It takes uh, – you've got to show that you're willing – because otherwise, I know some people can be a little guarded when someone approaches a stranger and says, hey, we're cousins. And I know sometimes you'll find those people who have those big family trees and and um, they're building family trees and they're not really that bothered about who's in the family tree. And they have a massive family tree and they're just adding people and they might be their, um, their wife's uncles, husbands, daughters, nephews, you know, all the way through this, this big link. And it means that they're not actually really blood relatives and they've just kept going because they enjoy the process. And that's fine on their own. It's great. But when we want to connect with people we're related to and things, and then we can share things, share photographs, things like that. And they're, they're quite personal. So it's um, it's important to um, to know, you know, that those are going to be looked after. And I know when people have given me photographs of family, they just go on my family tree and, and it's private and no one else can see them. So I know because they're not my photographs, they're someone else's. But sometimes other people might share them or might do something. Um, and, and it can be one of those things where when it happens to you, you might get a little bit more guarded and say oh i don't want to share photographs anymore i don't like that i don't like that someone took my picture and put it elsewhere or whatever but you have to i think it's a big point to make that not everyone um has that kind of mindset and and if you do share these pictures then then you know it might be time to think about you know the person who had the picture originally and and how they might feel and just ask them nicely because most of the time i'm sure they say yes but um also you know the new person that comes along who hasn't done any of this um, then maybe they need a chance as well. So I will happily you know, share you know, things that I have as well and things to see what happens. And 
of course, if I suddenly find the pictures somewhere on the internet, then I know I've done a bad thing. And, uh, and then I know not to keep sharing things. But before then, everyone gets a chance and it's important to share all that. So um, definitely. And there's nothing more exciting than seeing the face or, or a new document that relates to your ancestor or a relative or someone like that, especially when you can start to see family resemblances or you can find little bits of detail. So it's really worth doing, really exciting. And uh, I see uh, a lot of people saying they're talking about doing a DNA test, taking a look and things. And uh, that's uh, one of those uh, things that said it's definitely a, a new weapon that we have in our arsenal. It's very useful, very, very important to have a, a look at everything that we have at our disposal, whether it's new records or new technology. Very, very important, very, very useful. Um, I see um, lots and lots of more people talking about doing these tests, people saying they're going to contact new cousins. That's great. Um, I see um, Linda has lost a tiny amount of Scots they were happy with in the last shuffle. They got Irish to replace it, so they'll wait until there's another shuffle. Well, I mean, uh, we're all Celts, so, you know, it's all uh, uh, fine. We're all very similar. We're brothers and sisters across the water, so uh, don't worry too much. I think you're, you're welcome either side of the Irish Sea, so don't worry too much. And um, Karen asks a question, what extra details will the 1921 census contain versus the 1911? So every census asks different questions. Uh, the 1911 census, we know is called the fertility census by some people because it asks you how many children you've had, how many children are still alive, which can be really useful for finding those missing people. But the 1921 census has a lot more about occupation. And so it has details about where you work, but also the address of where you work and things like that. So you'll be able to find out where people work in detail, which factory they work in or which company they work for. And I think it might open a whole new branch of different study because I think we have lots of people who are doing one name studies or one place studies. But what about a one workplace study or something like that? Try and find all the people that work in one shop or work in one thing and find out about their lives because these are the people that hung around every day or something like that. I think there are some great PhD studies and, and general just family history things to look at that will be really interesting when it comes to that. And also for our own ancestors, it's going to be really interesting to find out about you know, who they hung around with. And, and when you see where they worked, you might be able to plot it on a map and say, ah, they live here because they work two streets away or something. Rather than knowing that your ancestor was a miner, you'll then know which mine they mined and that sort of thing. And you'll be able to see and make a better idea of you know, their life. You'll be able to plot out things in a much better way. So 1921 census, as well as the stuff that you've come to expect, you'll get that as well. So that's why it's going to be really exciting. And then really importantly, uh, within England and Wales, you've got no record of the 1931 census because that was destroyed by an errant spark in a fire, uh, not as a result of enemy action. It was during the Second World War. It was an accident, and all the remnants were swept away before anyone had a chance to inspect them. So there's no 1931 census for England and Wales. There is for Scotland, and uh, I won't say that's because it's colder up here and no, no fire can start, but uh, it was kept separately, and so that's why that's there. And then, of course, 1941 census we don't have because everyone was rather busy with something else. And so between 1921 and 1951, we've got the 1939 register, which is useful, but in terms of a census with all that detail, we don't have anything. So this, for England and Wales, is the big deal. This is the thing that's going to help because after this, we've got a long time to wait before the next one. And so we've got a big gap. And so we can get everything we can out of this 1921 census. And it's going to be something that's going to hopefully uh, answer a lot of questions, but also it's going to perhaps uh, put a bookend on census research, and it's going to then mean we can broaden out and start looking at other things like trade directories, postal directories and things, uh, electoral registers, because at this point, more and more people can vote. And we'll use other things to fill that gap to get to the 1939 register in between. So really, really important, really, really useful. But uh, yes, uh, definitely um, we're all excited for it and it will get different information and you will get more information as well. So it's really exciting when the 1921 census comes next year. Matthew saying it's very important. It's fun and helpful for both sides to get in touch with cousins. It is. It's great. I have uh, made some quite great friendships with uh, a number of fourth and fifth cousins and things like that. 
Uh, I know my Sicilian side. I'm, I know all my fourth and fifth cousins anyway because <laughs> we, we hang around a lot. Uh, so um, it's a little different for certain uh, cultures. But uh, in other cultures, particularly British culture and things, and I'm sure many of you don't know um, offhand, you know, from youth, your your fourth cousins and things. And so once you get in touch with them, you'll find, you know, there's a lot of people that have a lot of it in common because of their shared roots. And you might find you've got quite a lot to talk about. So it's, it's great. And uh, so definitely I encourage that uh, hugely. Uh, Sylvia is hoping the 1921 census will confirm the home address of her grandfather. It will prove he was the executor of a will. She'll also be able to see the first record of her mother and father. That's exciting. That's great. I'm looking forward as well. The 1921 census, I'm going to have a big list of things. I would prepare for when it comes out a list of all the things that you want to know. Put them down and just try and do it like a research question and say okay right i need to find this i need to find that go to all the 1911 censuses you have and people you think might be in the 1921 census and make a note of what you're going to go for so you can go with pinpoint accuracy you can find all of those direct ancestors because that would be the first thing i would do and then start thinking about all of the questions the interesting ones everyone's got that cousin that we're not that closely related to but they're just fascinating aren't they they're just the, the one that you really want to know about you want to finish their story and you want to add all the records you can i've got a couple like that and they're just i can't stick away from them and they're not they're not that close but i really need to know so i'm gonna have those on my list as well so it's a really big thing so make sure you've got that ready and i'm sure we might have some kind of research preparation session beforehand maybe and see what we can get together and maybe even share some templates or something but that's going to be really important and useful so um sue has asked a good question uh was there a similar register to 1939 register in scotland and ireland there was a scottish 1939 register it was taken across um the country and so that register is not digitized but it's available for the national registers and national records of scotland and uh, so uh, you can apply for that so that's uh, worth doing if you want to take a look at uh, that record you'll get a transcript you won't get the original record but uh, that can help and add a little bit more detail to your family tree in northern ireland there was one and that is under the care of peroni and you can take a hold of that you can get a copy uh, i think it's freedom information request you make there is a form and i think the peroni website will tell you how to do it and uh, you'll get a similar sort of information given to you i'm not sure if they're open again for doing that kind of thing at the moment with the current stuff going on but uh, it's always helpful to get the stuff ready so that uh, you can make that application and there wasn't a 1939 register in ireland because that was a separate country at the time it was in the republic of ireland so um, there's not something there because they stayed neutral during the war so they um, had uh, different priorities but uh, yes definitely take a look at northern irish 1939 register and the scottish one if you can get hold of and um, I see lots of people talking about the 1920 census and things they want to find. That's great. Um, and uh, Marion said at least one of her children has become interested in family history, mainly due to a free two-week offer. So she's going to encourage her by sharing all her paper card files. That's exciting. It's good. It's um, try and uh, I I found it really useful starting again rather than taking someone's research and uh, you know building from that tree. I used uh, the research of my great uncle to confirm and look and see where they got to and what they did and build up what I had and make sure that I was on the right track and things. So um, it's, it's exciting when you find that new ancestor and you keep going backwards. And so uh, I would uh, help them build their own tree and then get all your stuff out and see, you know, what, what where you've gone different and what's right and things and where you found things. And uh, it's a really nice experience. So it's great to keep uh, passing that on and sharing things. It's going to be exciting. Anya said that Fiona was discussing the 1939 register in Northern Ireland before. Might be worth asking again on Friday. Yes, that's a good point. Um, and uh, see a few other um, things going on. See, we're, we're going more towards the chat side, and let's see if we've got some more questions going in. So Karen has asked, she has a great aunt who worked in a cotton mill in Manchester. Are there records of who worked there online, or would I have to check with local archives? So, um, well, we've just talked about the 1921 census depending on the time that might be useful uh, because of this occupational data there are many private organizations that take make records around the country and 
there's no obligation for those records to be kept. They're just for the benefit of that company. And so they're in a different state of survival in different companies. And that's kind of a bit hit and miss. You will find, though, a number of them have been deposited with local archives, local libraries, things like that, local studies libraries, uh, regional archives. They're really, really useful. So definitely look at Manchester Central Library, uh, look at Manchester Archives, look at these places. They might have records of these mills and things. However, also, the mill may have closed and all the records may have gone straight into a skip. So we have to cross all our fingers and hope. But that's where I would look. And that's where I would start. And if you can't find anything there, start perhaps, depending on the time period, look at other things like maybe trade union records, maybe, um, again, trade directories, depending on the kind of mill and the size of it. Uh, there are other things you might be able to find that might give you some more information. If you know the mill itself, you might also be able to look for that mill in newspapers and find some more information too. So um, if you don't find it, don't give up hope. Uh, Daphne has said she's 59% Scottish but never lived there. Well, it's welcome for a visit. So if you'd like to come and visit Scotland, um, of course, when we're all allowed to, then uh, I'm sure everyone in Scotland will be glad to see you. It's a, a really a lovely, welcoming, warm place. And uh, as I say, it took me a generation to get back to Scotland, but uh, you know I've had nothing but warm uh, welcomes since I arrived. And uh, so Sylvia said she found some details about woolen mill employees in a PhD thesis. You'd be massively surprised about where you might find bits of information. Um, there's something that is always suggested in one of those big things is just look in Google. Sometimes there's really specific things that you might find relating to someone uh, just by Googling. There's a, a website about the, the Staffordshire Parish that some of my answers are from, Darleston. And there's a, a, a website made by someone that describes my four times great-grandfather's execution. And um, that was a story that um, I didn't really know about too much. Found this, got a bit more information, then went to newspapers with a bit of information I had and found everything. Found even his last words, you know, these really emotive things that I found with a little bit of extra help from looking at what other people have put online. So um, definitely, if you're really stuck, try Google, see what's there. You might find some uh, happy coincidence that will give you a little bit of help, a little bit of intro. But also, uh, try a bit of social history, try a bit of local history, and try a bit of context to understand what your ancestors might have been doing, what they might have been thinking, and that might give you a clue as to where they might appear in records too. So that's quite a, a big thing that I always think about as well. When I think about my ancestor was a shoemaker, I go, okay, how much money would a shoemaker really make? Would they perhaps have left the will? Are they that kind of profession? Would they be in electoral registers? Is this the year? Because that changes over time that they were allowed to vote because they earned that much money, or did they not? Were they still not allowed yet? And then I keep working these things through. Would they have had an apprentice? Would they have undertaken an apprenticeship? And all these things would then guide me to different records that might happen. Would they be in a guild? And all of these things, every single thing leaves a little mark, and we find them. It's really helpful sometimes to make a little sheet in something like Excel or even just with a notepad and just write down every single thing you might find. So people, for example, when they die, you have a death record, but you'll also have perhaps a burial record. You'll have a will, you'll have probate when that's uh, proved. And uh, then you'll have all these other things. You have a burial, and then you'll have that monumental inscription perhaps. And so there's lots of different places, obituaries, death notices, all of these things all revolve around that one event. So one event might create 10, 11, 12 different extra documents, and all of them could be useful for your family history research. So don't stop when you've got one record relating to an event. Think about all the records that might be created at that event and try and find them all. Write down all the ones that might occur and then hit them all. See, say, okay, have I made an exhaustive search for this? It might not be online. It might be somewhere else, but do I know where I might find it? And then I'll go look for it and go through until you've been sure that you've looked at all of the different possible things and places. Some of them might be a question mark you might have to go back to, but just make sure that you've got every chance to squeeze all of the information you can out of all these records. Uh, Shauna has asked, where do you find passenger lists for Liverpool to Canada for approximately 1865 to 1870? So we mentioned a little bit earlier about passenger lists and about how 1890 was the uh, year that the second copy uh, was published and given to the uh, the Board of Trade. And that's when we get a full 
relatively comprehensive collection of passenger lists. And there is a tiny selection of early passenger lists, and they're on Find My Past. It's the only place you'll find them. And um, they, they are a small amount, but there are a number of them going to Canada, United States, etc. So take a look at those, but don't be, you know, cross all your fingers, get ready. Um, if you do get them, play the lottery that night, something like that, because you, you're quite lucky. Um, the other records, there's no obligation for them to be kept, and they may not have survived. So you know, just watch out. But don't let me put you down. Definitely try, because if that record's there and we've never looked for it, then you know we'll never forgive ourselves. So always, if there's a chance, take the chance, always, when it comes to records. Um, Andrew said, will the 1921 census show date of birth in detail like the 1939 register? It gives age. It doesn't give date of birth. Um, there were three times great uncle who, according to the 1939 register, was a widower, but his death certificate makes no mention of a late wife. That is interesting. That's one. Um, I would say, uh, yeah, um, if he is a widower um, and you'd seen that, take a look perhaps at his will. Um, it, the Government probate death index for England and Wales is a really good place to find out if he left a will or any kind of probate and see who may have inherited. It might give you a clue as to other people and maybe you might find a relative of this wife family that perhaps is elusive. Um, it's only a small chance, but it's worth a go. And if not, then that will might have um, some more detail of your family anyway and give you some more detail definitely about that uncle. Um, but yes, the 1921 census will show ages rather than date of birth. The 1939 register is good for that date of birth. Um, it's not perfect. There's a, every once in a while a slight discrepancy and things like that, but it's usually quite good because they used it for the basis of the National Health Service and that NHS register. So that's a, a big thing and uh, a big important one. Um, let's take a look at some more. So um, Angela has spent three nights in Scotland where they got 46% ethnicity. In 2015, their one and only visit, along with nights in other ancestor origin sites from Kent, Cornwall, Flintshire and Liverpool. But they were born in, in Strathalbyn, South Australia. Ethnicity is a fun tool to watch, but the solid research holds no relationship to the ethnicity estimate. Yes, so that's what, what we were talking about before. You're right, Angela. Um, a whole branch of one Scottish fa family moved to the Falkland Islands in the 1850s and still have family there. Now, that's amazing. The Falkland Islands will, um, again, with such a small population, have some really comprehensive record collections. Uh, and that'll be really interesting. So uh, definitely, hopefully, you've fleshed out that family tree and have some more detail in there. So uh, I'm uh, slightly jealous. And uh, here we go. So Helen has said they found a passenger list for relatives but can't find where they go once they've arrived in port. What documents were looking to help? All went to Brunswick and then settled in Detroit. So when you're looking from the passenger list, depending on the year, later American passenger lists um, have detail of um, where someone is intending to live and move. Uh, Brunswick means they'd be coming in through Canada, so you won't get that particular. Um, but I would say you got cross-border crossings. So um, when someone moved from Canada to the US, uh, if it's the right kind of time, you might get a document created there. And then you've got things like censuses. Um, and uh, censuses would be useful in the US. And then, of course, naturalization papers, because they will tell you which ship someone arrived in, uh, how many years they've been here. And that will help. And the census is that I find in America when it tells you whether they're naturalized or not in that extra column, extra field. If it says they're naturalized, I then go looking for those papers because they can have lots of detail. In. They can even have a photograph. So definitely take a look for those. And hopefully your ancestors did naturalize. And that will give you that extra bit of information. Um, if you've got a relatively common name, try and think a little bit more about it. So it looks like a, a family that you're looking for. Try and again use that someone else in the household and try and search using, go to the all record sets, find one census at a time that you're looking for and see how many people come back and try and use the whole family as your reference. Look at their age, look at things like that. Maybe even try their place of birth and see how many you can get and take a look and see if the year, if you've got their passenger list, you'll know the year they arrived and you can look in these American censuses and you can see their arrival year written down and you'll know maybe if you've got the right person. So that would be what I would do to make sure until you've narrowed down and hit that person and when you've got it, then that will open up a lot of extra doors. So that's where I would look for this. 
I see um, T. Matthew's got a good point. They keep a list or a spreadsheet of all the records relating to their great grandfather, Florence John Donovan. He's Florence John on his birth certificate, John on his marriage certificate, an army record, and his son's birth and marriage certificates. On the census, he varies between Florence, Florian, and John, and that date of birth varies too. And mostly it's only slightly out, but that's a good point of using that Excel or using something and just making notes, even notes on your family tree, just keep it in the notes section of all of the different names people use and all the different ways so that you have it when you remember to go back. Because there are some people that we might not look at for a year or two and come back and find something. Oh, I found some new records that are released and I want to look inside here. And when you do, you can't remember the nicknames that your ancestor used or something. So once you've got it all there ready, imagine that you're showing your tree to someone completely new and put in everything that you can that they would hopefully find the information with. So whenever you've got a record, don't just put, I found it on Farm My Past, put the name of the record collection, put all these different things inside so that you, someone else will know where to find that record. If they had to do it, if they wanted to find the same thing, they could do it. And that's a way of proving and keeping a good solid base for your tree. It's good to start now, but if you haven't started now, don't worry, there's no better time than today. And just try and ground everything. Make sure that if, say, if you lost your memory today, tomorrow, you could look at every person and you could remember everything. You could go and find the same records again. Let's imagine that happened. And then if you had a really well-sourced, well-thought-out family tree, it wouldn't matter too much because you could just recreate the whole thing. It's really important. I see um, Ellie has shared the links to these border crossing records we've got as well. So take a look at those too. Uh, when we talked about crossing from Canada to the US and Sylvia has said there, cite your sources. That's the big thing, isn't it? Really important. Let's try and do that if we can and uh, make sure you can take a look. I've been doing some stuff with some Welsh parish registers recently and uh, I make sure that I take the reference, the page number, uh, the, the parish, the year, um, and the archives that it's from and put that all in so I know and uh, that way if I need to find the paper version or anything I can still find it so it's really important so uh, Cindy has said they can't locate their great grandfather Garbert Hill's burial place there's no record or reference of him being buried with either of his wives at Durham Road Cemetery Stockton on Tees and no records for cremation he seems to have disappeared from any burial records at the local record offices Okay, so that sounds like you've gone for the local burial records because one thing to be aware of when you look at burial records and we look at parish registers, there's also council burials at this kind of point later on in, in history from about the 1850s onwards. Always ask that question, is there a government burial around? Because they might be in there instead and they might not be in a church. So that's important. Um, I'd start with that. And if I had looked at those council burial grounds and there's metropolitan cemeteries and things like that i still hadn't found them if it was an era of parish registers beforehand they're all online i would look at that if they're not online i'd still look at that i'd go to a record office or something like that and parish registers continue this is one thing to remember that they stop online at you know around about the 1920s usually because of privacy concerns because of course we have to make sure that we keep modern records private but people continue to be buried in parish churchyards, even to this day. And so there may well be local parish records that you can look at at a local archive or at a local church, even if they're still relatively very modern, and you might find some details there. There are also collections of monumental inscriptions from these places that will go further into the modern day too. They're a little easier to get hold of. So take a look at those too. Um, they will be of use and um, maybe even if you're nearby um, have a little bit of a wander around these places and see if you can find something sometimes um, when you know if you take a look at your relatives burial and you see the people that are buried there because you say you've got some relatives that have been buried in one place see if you've got the record of that burial how deep that burial is and you might find out there's no room for the person in there and that would be a great explanation as to why they're buried somewhere perhaps nearby but not quite in the same place that will be an explanation for you so i would start with that and hopefully that will get you a little bit closer um here we go Club beverly's asked any tips for finding parentage of someone who's born in 1776 and died 1833 two children baptized in st botolph in london eight more in croydon where he had a clay pipe business till he died can't find an apprenticeship no settlement records also a surname with many variants so i'm guessing we've got a marriage record so that would be important if you haven't start with that with the name of the parents that you've got from the baptisms um from 1812 things get more detailed so we're probably 
So yeah, he's probably married before then, I would say, but there'll still be some detail. Marriages have a bit more detail a bit earlier than that. And um, that will give you the name of his wife. It'll give you some more information. Um, 1776. If he's in London, he may have come from elsewhere. He may not. And um, it depends very much. So look at the areas that he's in. Um, look at his wife. Look at this sort of thing. Find out where his wife is from. Um, and perhaps see if you can find if you if you don't know anywhere where these people are from and you, you don't know you know you're trying to find some clue you're clutching at straws if you've got the wife's name you've got his name um then take those two individuals and look and try and find out see if there's two people of that name baptized within let's say five or ten mile radius of the marriage and to try and just just get a feel to see if they might they plausibly have been in the same area. If you can't find anything, and it's not a guarantee, but then maybe you might have to think they may have come from much further afield and then start having to think about really broad searches and start working things out. One of the things that I do as well when I have lots of possible matches and I've got all these different people that might be my ancestor, because this happens a lot. You'll find many times you'll get three or four baptisms and you're not sure which one is the one. Then you can take the uh, records and you can build a little bit of a family tree. You can build a thing for each person and try and finish their life, try and go through them and see what happened to each one. One perhaps may have died age two. One perhaps uh, might have married in somewhere else. One person uh, disappears from the records and your person appears. And that gives you something to question and to ask and say, hmm, maybe that's the way to do it. And then, you know, as we go through, you'll find that the number of plausible matches will narrow and narrow and narrow down. And you might then only have one, which is what we're all hoping for. But uh, that's one thing I do as well. So don't be afraid to do someone else's family tree for a little bit in terms of those people with the similar names, because it might lead you to the person you're looking for. So when you've got lots of people, definitely start doing that as well um let's see what else we've got here um lots and lots um linda always had lots of notes unfortunately sometimes she's been too cryptic it made sense when she wrote it obviously <laughs> um uh, carol has said that she's late joining but if i answer the question um was she able to access the broadcast later you can access all of these broadcasts anytime you want and um, you can go backwards right now or which I don't recommend, stay for this, start again a bit later, anything like that. Or you can go to our video section on YouTube and on Facebook, and you can look at all of these anytime you want. It's a big library of different family history questions, queries, interesting things, so don't worry about that at all. Um, let's take a look. So um, Janine has said she's got a record of a five times great grandfather making an appearance as a defendant in Chancery Court in Dublin, 10th of May, 1768, trying to figure out his crime. But now I understand the Court of Chancery would deal only with civil issues like probate and wills. So looking for confirmation of that. You're right. Chancery Court is more about financial issues and things like that. Um, it wouldn't have been any a nefarious crime in that sense it'll be things like trying to prove inheritance or business disputes and this kind of thing so um i think irish chancery court records are on farmer past ones that survive from what i remember I, th I don't think all of them did but i think some of them have been transcribed in earlier times and survived through that so that's one thing i would look for um i think the Betham, Thrift and Crossel genealogical extracts are really good for that because they have lots of detail in uh, their large indexes of records that were created before the Four Courts fire. So that's one place to look as well as some Irish records and uh, definitely uh, look at everywhere you can for those and uh, I'm sure there'll be a little bit more for you um so uh, there we go so um lindo's made a point that the person looking for st bottles in london there's more than one uh, there's st bottles in bishopsgate and one without oldgate and there's an archive of the area called bishop case institute might be worth contacting so there we go um that's uh, another thing to remember when we look at names like st mary's there may be 30 st mary's in a different city or something like that so make sure you try and narrow down as much as possible when we look at that and don't narrow down that um you know you're in the wrong place because you picked the wrong st mary or something like that and see what else we have 
Um, my great grandfather changed our surname and religion. We were Campbell, Casey, and Catholic. He came to Scotland, dropped Casey because Campbell um, be became Campbell and became Protestant. Total brick wall for nearly a year. Then my mum found a file with my dad's stuff in it. Now I have a name pre changed to search for. Oh, there we go. So um, that's one of the things as well. When, when play, people move, um, I found the same with some of my Irish relatives. Um, they've gone from McAfee uh, to McPhee to be a little more Scottish when they arrived and things. And um, a lot of them uh, decided to claim they were born in Scotland for those small children when actually they were born in Ireland and they came over on the boat. So um, it's interesting how these people will try and um, blend in because obviously there's a lot of persecution, a lot of hard times at that point. So if you could blend in a little more, then it would, might make your life a bit easier. So it's quite understandable that that may have happened. And uh, you have to take a look at things with that social and local history vein and that, that idea to take a look and see um, what our ancestors may have done by looking at the times that they lived in, looking at the context and seeing if the culture might give you a suggestion for what's going on. Uh, see what we have here. Um, Marion said, how do I hide the pinned post on question of the week? It's taking up half my screen. I'm on an iPhone. Well, I'll try and say them out loud as quickly as possible and drop them as quickly as I can as well so that we can see. I mean, uh, I think the, the audio is more important than, than looking at me anyway. Um, I'll try and uh, not uh, do any quick change costumes or anything like that. But uh, yes, um, let's uh, try and make sure that I'll uh, hide them as quickly as we can, but I'll always read them out loud as well. So um, let's see what we've got here. There's some very large ones as well. I think we're questioning some of them are quite large because people have a lot to explain with some context. So this is going to be one of those ones that is uh, a broad one. Um, so um, Angela has said that her father has two shipping records to South Australia in 1951 when he was 15. She asked him about it and he reports he failed his medical for the first trip due to working in dairy farm. He had ringworm. He had to wait until they cleared before he could travel. I'm grateful the first record was much more informative than the second. That is interesting. You will sometimes find records that have been put a line through in certain passenger lists. Those people that were booked to travel and didn't travel, things like that. So there are a few stories you can find in there. Uh, I found a couple of those now and then. I think a, a Cleland once was supposed to go to Canada and didn't in the end and went a month or two later and things in this so there are interesting stories that we can pull through and we can only guess why uh, and you've got the story so that's quite exciting but uh, definitely um they are very very useful uh let's see what we've got here some more um questions let's see um if there's any some more on the early questions as well because i know i've got to get to some of those too Kyra Cerevel has said um, her great grandmother was a dressmaker at Neville's on Edgware Road in London who had modeled dresses for royalty. Um, we've been told it's because she didn't sweat and therefore wouldn't mark the garments. Um, her name is Ethel Mary Youngman, born 10th of September 1887 to Alice Plant and William Youngman, who was a constable with the Met Police in Marlborough from 1876. Who did she model dresses for? I've also been told she had a portrait painted by Sir Herbert Tree which used to hang in an art gallery in London, that she was friends with an actress called Isabel Jeans, and they started a hat fashion in London, which was reported in the newspaper. Haven't been able to prove any of these as facts. Any help would be appreciated. Okay, so first of all, um, your hat fashion, you say it was reported in the newspaper. We've got loads of fashionable newspapers in the Farmer Pass newspaper collection and the British newspaper archive. Take a look at those. That's a really good start. And, of course, they will also cover other kinds of things to do with fashion, other kinds of other things relating to modeling, relating to clothing, uh, really good place to look for any of these interesting rumors, no matter what they may be, to fit in. I would also say, when you look for anything that re relates to maybe a portrait that's been painted or an object, if any of you have tradespeople ancestors, now this is a cool tip, which I found a few great things doing. There are a couple of places to look for evidence for artifacts. And you can look at the Victorian Albert Museum catalog and you can see all the things they have in their collection. The British Museum as well, although they have many fewer objects. British Library has objects. 
there are, there are all these different places that can have things. The Victorian Albert Museum has one of, um, I know we think possibly one of Jen Baldwin's ancestors' uh, works, and uh, also one of my ancestors' locks that was made as they were a locksmith long ago. All these different things you can find. The Victorian Albert Museum is free uh, to search, and um, they also usually have photographs of the objects, and that's what we're looking for, and it'll tell you things about them. You'll have maker's marks, you'll have lots of details, so really useful. And the same goes with portrait galleries. There's the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery in London, and those also will have things like painted portraits, things that you can look at, and often uh, you'll be able to get a copy of that, sometimes for free, sometimes for very, very cheap indeed, and then you'll have that painted portrait, and they go back for centuries. But they have a huge collection, and they're usually searchable by name, so take a look and see what you might find. You might find the painter, you might find the person who's a sitter, search for both see what you can find they are always really really useful um i'm currently as i've uh, been doing up my house i'm looking for all kinds of different things to go on the walls and uh, i found those portrait galleries really really useful you might see just slightly to one side of me i have an 1842 map of edinburgh that i'm just about to frame and uh, all those things have come from those portrait galleries and things and those uh, national libraries and stuff so take a look at those two and you might find something relating to ancestors so it looks like we've hit an hour with our exciting uh, chat. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, I know that time flies when we talk about family history. It's one of those things. And I'm going to be seeing you again on Friday where we'll have a question of the week come up very shortly. Uh, I'll have a chat with Ellie about that and we'll come up with something exciting for you. But um, in the meantime, any of you that have had questions answered or you've talked amongst yourselves about different things, come back on Friday and tell us what you found or tell us what you searched and if you've got any further and tell us any tips that you enjoyed and hopefully you know, it might help someone else as well. So it's really, really useful. It's been great to hang out with you again. Uh, I really enjoy our time again and um, uh, I see lots and lots of comments about certain themes coming through. And so I think uh, we might be able to perhaps uh, pull some of these themes together and see if we can get some themes chats going on as well. And I will try and um, uh, we'll uh, go through and um, see if I can answer some more on Friday. Maybe I can think of some good things and see if there's anything to spot. But uh, definitely go through. And I said, um, uh, yeah, we're um, going to... Um, enjoy i think this every month so every second wednesday if you didn't get your question answered we didn't get around to it don't worry come back uh, if you think of something else afterwards don't worry come back anything you can go for let's do it uh, if not i will see you on friday and it's fun enough just to hang around with you guys and to to enjoy sharing family history uh, stories and everything else and on friday definitely is the time for all of our fun and stories uh, i wonder who i'm going to be related to this week it just never ends but uh, thanks very much for coming and uh, i look forward to seeing you then so i will see you on friday and uh, have a great few days and if i don't see you on friday have a great week and uh, hopefully find some new discoveries and uh, definitely enjoy building those family trees in the meantime see you later on <laughs>